And now it's time for this hour's news review. The Russian Prime Minister is in China on a visit aimed at signing a series of deals as Moscow and Beijing have been cementing bilateral ties in recent months. Mikhail Mishustin landed late on Monday in Shanghai. He took part in a Russian-Chinese business forum as part of his two-day trip. Mishustin predicted that the bilateral trade turnover will reach $200 billion this year. He expressed Russia's readiness to considerably raise agriculture exports to China. His deputy, Alexander Novak, also said there will be a 40 percent rise in Russian energy supplies to China in 2023. Moscow has been seeking stronger bonds with Beijing, an economic giant, to stave off Western sanctions imposed over the Ukraine war. And the two countries' relations are deepening while their leaders have pledged a new world order devoid of Western dominance. I can welcome my guests uh, to this uh, news review. Out of uh, Montreal, Matthew Eret, Senior Fellow, American University in Moscow. And out of Oslo, Glenn Deason, uh, Professor of Political Science, University of Southeastern Norway. Welcome both of you to the program. Well, let's start off with uh, Matthew. Um, we have seen now that the uh, Russian Prime Minister is in China. Let's talk about the significance uh, of his visit and, and the growing ties between Moscow and Beijing. Well, this is extremely significant and a sign of the, the changing times. As it stands right now, the financial system in the West that has been directed by the city of London and Wall, and Wall Street for a very long time is in its uh, death rattling phase right now of breakdown. and. There is a new uh, game emerging, which has really uh, taken on a new life as uh, Russia and China have demonstrated that they have a much better grasp of thinking about economics and security and the idea of international relations in a much, much healthier fashion than that which has destroyed so many countries and lives over the past 70 years. So uh, the fact that you have now agreements being signed on trade, energy, um, agriculture, you name it. This is a very, very important set of developments that's coming out of this deal that is, I think, going to just enshrine and give even greater support to the rise of the BRICS-led structure of multipolarity that's really winning over so much of the world right now. Well, Glenn, what about that multipolarity? Where would you say we are in this transition from that unipolar world to the multipolar world and the role you see Russia and China um, uh, playing in the lead for this new world order? Well, I think that the transition has already occurred. That is, uh, of course, after the Cold War, uh, there was a unipolar system organized around the United States. Uh, I think that uh, most people recognized it would be a temporary phenomenon, phenomenon because uh, it, it required the United States to use too much resources directing it from the core and spending it at the periphery, not only ex exhausting its resources, but also its legitimacy as uh, the amount of wars uh, it has launched to uphold uh, unipolarity. So what, what we see now is uh, obviously a huge economic shift from the West to the East. So the world is already multipolar. Part of the conflicts we have today is that uh, the U.S. is attempting to uh, restore the unipolar order, which uh, requires it to uh, cut down both you know, countries like Russia, China down in size in order to uh, restore this global primacy. Uh, but again, I think that uh, in the economic sphere, we see that this is counterproductive because uh, not just the Russians and the Chinese, but uh, uh, India, well, most other centers of the world, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iran, most are now seeking uh, to diversify away from the United States in order to have many economic partners so they can't be bullied. Uh, so the more the U.S. pressures to try to restore unipolarity, the more you see multipolarity uh, strengthen itself. But the problem we have now, of course, is that we're in between these two orders. Uh, uh, you know, the Americans pulling it, trying to pull back to unipolarity, the rest of the world moving towards multipolarity. And this is part of the reason why we have these uh, conflicts. Uh, but uh, th this is the, the, the format which, uh, of course, both the Russians and the Chinese uh, have, have a vision for. They want to have a multipolarity, but it has to be reflected in the economy. That means multipolarity in terms of technological capabilities, industries, transportation corridors, uh, 
the financial centers, uh, the banks, uh, banking which are used, the currencies which are used, multiple art has to be reflected throughout the economy and that's what they're working very hard on at the moment. And as we are going through this transition, um, Matthew, do you see it as uh, dangerous in some ways that because of the United States and of course it's waning power and, and not seeming to want to accept the unipolarity uh, reality um, and we see threats every day, whether we're talking about against Russia, we're talking about against China or Iran um, and so many other countries. Is it also a, a dangerous time in many ways? Well, certainly a, a, a wounded animal that feels cornered is not a safer animal to be around. And certainly the United States right now being drunk on a lot of hubris and still holding on to this delusion that 1992's promise of a new world order, according to a certain unipolar script, is is somehow going to be revived. This is very dangerous. And I, I, I do think that this does increase the type of desperation which could be uh, launched. I, I think economically the United States and the broader G7 has very little to work with as far as being able to threaten or challenge things like the Belt and Road Initiative, which has incredible extensions into Russia. We're increasingly see seeing the uh, the development of this these types of uh, transportation corridors and interconnectivity and long-term thinking about investments uh, coming to life in Central Asia, Southwest Asia, across Africa. So the, the power that the U.S. and the broader G7 once wielded to threaten countries into submission is no longer really there. The U.S. has lost its ability to produce and to manufacture, as have many of the countries of Europe. And they've become, you know, well known for sabotaging their own allies, as we've seen in the case of Germany, um, which has witnessed a U.S.-directed destruction of, a, of the Nord Stream 2 co-run by Germany or co-owned by Germany. Also, the Ukrainians are obviously being set up to be uh, sacrificial lambs. And increasingly, Taiwan is seeing that their own semiconductor manufacturing uh, sector is possibly going to be destroyed by the United States, which says that it loves and cares about their liberties so much. <laughs> um, so I, I think that the only option that they might have to try to reassert their their particular script to a new world order, the, the outdated one that never really could have existed, is perhaps the unleashing of, uh, of nuclear war and overthrowing the entire game board in chaos. That is a, a risk and a danger that I think is a real one. Hmm, well, that's frightening in itself. Uh, Glenn, uh, what about the, uh, I want to look at the financial side of things because we know that the United States weaponized, uh, for example, SWIFT and, and used that uh, um, readily uh, to sanction various countries and to punish them, if you want to say that, and pressure them. Um, do you think that Russia, China, and other countries now in, in this block will be able to soon get up and running a viable um, substitute? Of course, many are already trading in their uh, local currencies, but something as extensive as uh, SWIFT is, uh, your take on that? Well, something, uh, alternatives are already in place, but again, the, some of this is taking time, but we, because the entire financial system has been organized around the United States and the uh, collective West since the end of World War II. And well, on a larger scale, we can say that it's been uh, organized or centered around the West for centuries now. So uh, so it's going to take time. But, but as we saw, um, uh, especially after 2014, when the Western states began to put uh, sanctions on Crimea, um, that uh, they, 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 that alternatives uh, were required for 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 SWIFT. So the Russians came up with an alternative. Uh, the Chinese as well in 2015, uh, what they call SIPS. Uh, so you already have uh, a lot of uh, different systems emerging, but this is only the transaction system. Uh, the, the codes they, they send between the banks. Uh, what you also need to do is, of course, diversify away from the dollar. And we see there's a, a lot of initiatives. You can do it in different ways. Uh, you have this uh, exchange of local currencies. This is something uh, that many countries are embracing, uh, especially India has become a big proponent because, um, well, they don't want to be a victim of the secondary sanctions of the West. Uh, but uh, we also have uh, different initiatives, uh, different countries aspiring to set up collect common currencies. Uh, this is the BRICS countries, for example. They're playing with the idea of establishing a new currency, a common currency linked to gold. Uh, 
so do you have um, you have various initiatives, but it, but it's going to take uh, some time to um, to get to, to push through to to build up. But of course, this uh, sanction war against Russia has really brought a lot of impetus towards uh, growing this new financial system because. Uh, what, when uh, the Western power seized the funds of the Russian central bank and began this extensive uh, financial uh, sanctions, uh, you know, the, the, the clear message was this could happen to anyone. Uh, indeed, I think the Americans made it very clear that the, the Chinese could be next. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, the rest of the world is not safe either, because this means that the rest of the West can dictate the, the uh, uh, how, 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 which, which country would trade with? So South Korea, no, sorry, South Africa is supposed to be a, a friend of the West. Well, they're threatened now by the Americans. Georgia, a key, a key uh, friend of the West, also now the Americans are threatening them if they even open their airspace with the Russians. Uh, India is threatened. Malaysia, it's just across the world. It's both uh, allies and adversaries. And uh, so I think that the. Uh, we, we put sanctions on such a huge part of the world now that the, 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 the main concern is that we're beginning to isolate ourselves. All right. And on that note, thank you both for being with me on this news review. Matthew Eret, a senior fellow at American University in Moscow out of uh, Montreal, and uh, Glenn Deeson, professor of political science, University of Southeastern Norway out of Oslo. And thank you, viewers, for staying with us for another news review.